Tokyo. Good morning to everyone in the UK. And um, well, I guess good evening to anyone else joining us from around the world. We are delighted to have together such an amazing bunch of humans today to talk about something that is so close to our hearts, which is the story of disability innovation. And today we're live from Tokyo. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we had hoped to be live live and have to apologize on behalf of Zoom in the UK, which is currently not functioning, um, but we will not be perturbed. So you will be watching this on YouTube or in clips on social media. And I still think it's a really, really exciting uh, discussion to have. And I personally can't wait since we're in such amazing company. So to start off a little bit of access, you will find um, if you uh, look a transcript attached to this video and you can also uh, click on the link to the live closed captions um, which will be shown for you in real time via streamtext.net. Um, the second thing is that we will be asking some questions as we go and we will be recording by transcript and that's adapted slightly from the plan due to the slight tech change um, but Rest assured, we will make sure that it's accessible to everyone. So I am absolutely delighted this morning to have this group of people um, with me all well, this evening. And I really don't think I've ever been in such auspicious company. Um, I I'll be talking to you and I'm Vicky Austin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of GDI Hub. Um, but much more importantly, we are joined by Kaz Walton, who is perhaps one of the only people experiencing her second Tokyo Paralympic Games today or tomorrow, um, as well as Professor Catherine Holloway, Professor Masa Inkech, Ka um, Kai Konsei from Kyo University, Professor Kotuo Minamazawa, and Julia Wawareski from the GDI Hub. So without further ado, uh, I will begin. And I really want to take a moment just to say thank you so much for joining us on this disability innovation journey. Many of you will know the Global Disability Innovation Hub. We are a research and practice centre driving disability innovation for a fairer world. We were launched in Rio in 2016 and of course building on the legacy of the London 2012 Paralympic Games. We're now though operational in over 35 countries working with more than 70 partners on a profile of activity that's about 50 million pounds. It sounds hard and it kind of is, um, but we're doing it all because we want to make a change. And so far, GDI Hub has managed to reach 21 million people. And that's pretty much since we started counting in 2018. Through bold approaches and innovative partnerships like this one and creating ecosystems to accelerate change. So what we really try and do is um, bring together new partners to try and tackle old challenges. Because we think innovation is much more than a product or a service or a policy. It's a way of thinking. And actually that has gained us WHO Collaborating Centre status. So we're an official Collaborating Centre of the WHO on Assistive Technology, um, the only one in the world actually, and the founding organisation of We The 15, which I shall come on to talk about a little bit more. But before we move forwards, let's go back, not quite as far as Kaz is going to go, but just to London nine years ago. And this moment um, I use because it's the moment I realised we changed something. So on the slide is a picture of the billboard that I saw as I was walking outside of the Olympic Park at the end of the Olympic Games in 2012. I was exhausted. We'd been working really hard with my co-founder Ian McKinnon and making sure that the Games was gonna, as accessible as possible and the Olympic Games was the most accessible possible and that the Paralympics was about to be the most accessible possible. But when we looked up and we saw this billboard, we realised that everything had changed. It says thanks for the warm up from Channel 4 and it, I realised that the approach that we were going to take to disability was going to be different. There was a spark of change. Innovative approach and changed mindsets resulted from this kind of tongue in cheek approach and more than anything, the embedding of disability inclusion right from the start. And, you know, that's where GDI Hub came from. Many of you will have seen uh, the Channel 4 campaign this time, and this time it says it's rude not to stare, which I kind of love. And it chimes really well with what the BPA has used, impossible to ignore, and just thinking about the way that the Paralympics can drive change. And that's where we came from. Our genesis was the London 2012 Paralympic Games. And our founding partners, UCL, Loughborough University, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, um, University of the Arts London, Sadler's Wells Theatre, Victorian Abbey Museum, the Royal College of Art and then in Cheshire uh, and our many many collaborators around the world, the most important of which today is definitely Keogh University, 
um, have helped us think about disability innovation. And we're two things. We're an academic research centre inside of University College London, and we're also a community interest company, and that's the bit that I run. And as I mentioned, we're um, working on 15 million pounds of programmes around the world. The largest is around getting assistive technology to the people that need it. So you may or may not know, but 900 million people currently need access to assistive technology around the world. And we're trying to do what we can to address that. So how do we work? Well, if you'd like to know more, you can look at our new disability innovation strategy, which is available on our website. But basically, we think the best way to do things innovatively is to start with some research that's based on evidence, to try some stuff and innovate for change, to use programmes to test what works, to then teach what we've learnt and then advocate for policy change and more investment in the sector. And we do that across AET, inclusive design, education, tech, climate crisis resilience and cultural participation. And so kind of as I come towards the close and hand over to my next speaker, I just wanted to reflect on how we do what we do. And that is none of it by ourselves. So the image on the screen shows you our students in the top left for our new master's programme on design, disability, innovation, figuring some new models of, of making stuff work out in East London. Top right is our brand new innovation accelerator led by AMREF, who are a charity, the largest NGO in Africa, that's working on disability innovation for the first time. Um, Bernard Chiara, our director there, is right in the centre. Bottom right, we've got the team running the World Report on Assistive Technology at the WHO, and you can't quite see Cathy's face, but she's on that photo and she's part of the gang developing that World Report, so policy change through partnership. And bottom left, not to be forgotten, so we work really hard with our partners um, at Community Level 2, and this is the gang in Freetown, Sierra own some slum dwellers that we're working with in the community in Dwarves Arc. And so um, I guess if we move on to the next slide, Julia, you'll see our model of disability inclusion, which we published last week, and we'll make sure is available and already is on our website, actually. We did some research on London and we, we looked at how disability inclusion was done in London. And I think I always thought that it was about setting a mission in a bid and then driving through disability inclusion change. But actually, what we found was not that. We found that the London 2012 partners, yes, were responsible for driving through that change, but they were not responsible for the original ideas for the mission setting. And that, to me, is a really exciting piece of work. So we called our paper that we've just published, uh, this is the story of community leadership with political backing. And that's exactly what it was. So disabled people's organisations or organisations of persons with disabilities in East London and London knew what needed to be done to embed disability inclusion. And in order to do that, they were able to influence and infiltrate organisations in order to make that change a reality. So some people became leaders in the movement, like Margaret Higgish, who we sadly lost this year, but became uh, a, such a leader in inclusive design. And then others became advocates for change. And, and through that process, we've had um, such an important uh, set of learnings that we were really grateful to be able to share those in the paper this week. And we hope that they'll be useful to other cities um, and campaigns too. And so I finish on perhaps the most exciting thing that's happened since London 2012, which is We The 15. And this is a video um, which was taken by Cathy in Piccadilly Circus on Thursday evening at 9 p.m. And it shows the 10 minutes. Um, Julia, if you could press play for those that can, can view the video. It's a time-lapse footage for those that don't see it of the central billboard in the middle of Piccadilly Circus showing a series of images of We The 15. And we The 15 is a campaign that's been launched by the International Paralympic Committee and 20 other international organisations of which GDI Hub is a founding partner. And it's, it's designed to say over the next 10 years, 15% of the world are persons with disabilities. Many of them are easily recognisable, many of us aren't. And it's important that we have joined forces, a marriage between human rights organisations, advocacy organisations and sport to harness the power of sport for disability innovation and disability inclusion. And you will see much, much more. Um, many things turn purple on Thursday, including 125 iconic buildings around the world, many in Tokyo too. And I know that you guys kicked it all off. Um, I can't wait to see what happens next as we launch. 
but that's enough from me because I am by far not the most exciting person speaking today. I have the honour and pleasure of now handing over to um, a conversation or to, to beginning a conversation with the legend that is Kaz Walton. Um, for those of us who are Paralympics nerds like me, um, this is a special moment indeed. Um, and maybe we can uh, sort of maybe we can spotlight Kaz for this because it would be great to see her 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 talk um, rather than the slides because I just would love to um, ask you a couple of questions, Kaz, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, firstly, I guess uh, an introduction. So Kaz was um, is a retired wheelchair athlete and former Great British team manager. She was a multidisciplinary gold medalist and competed in numerous Paralympic Games between 1964 and 1976 and won a whole host of medals in a series of sports um, and took a break uh, before coming back to support athletes. And I think this is Kaz's second Tokyo Paralympics. So, I mean, just to that point alone, we have to uh, honour our... Uh, I know our opportunity here to ask, what was your experience of the, the first Tokyo Paralympics, Kaz? And Julia, maybe we can see Kaz. It was, um, <clears throat> it was an extraordinary Games for me, but I guess everybody's first Games is extraordinary. Uh, and I was just fo so fortunate to be here because I'd only been competing internationally for about a year. I was still pretty young. And uh, I wasn't originally selected, and somebody went sick with about three weeks to go. I didn't know that. Yes, and I got I got hauled in, and I turned up in Tokyo, <laughs> not even really knowing quite what I was going to be, be competing in. <laughs> so um, it was uh, it was a very pleasant experience for me, and it, an extremely exciting one. I'd never been out of the country before, so to come to Tokyo. Uh, and have that experience and differences in culture and, and um, it was just phenomenal for me and I, it began a lifelong addiction. <laughs> I don't know, it's the only way of describing it, I think. But it was a it was a very it's a very different world in those days. So uh, because places weren't particularly accessible. And we weren't able to get out and about and see things outside of competition very much. It's a bit like COVID today, actually. Ah, so it's quite similar, your experience of Tokyo during the Paralympics. In that respect as well, which is a shame because the accessibility has changed so much, of course. But I do have a, an endearing memory of, of the, the warmth and the willingness of the people, the volunteers, to help to do everything that they could and to put on what turned out for certainly for me to be an absolutely fantastic games perfect and i guess that's really interesting because the accessibility in tokyo has changed right i know that tokog and the the city have been working and the cities have been working so hard to try and make a difference yes I Certainly have, and the public transport is is very accessible. I came out about three years ago to do an access survey uh, for Paralympics GB, and I, I was I was amazed because things were so accessible. The transport was accessible. I'm talking from a wheelchair perspective, yeah. but in actual fact, it was just a better experience all round for any type of disability. I mean, what a joy and delight! Um, to, to be able to find accessible toilets in every, every station yeah. uh, and to be able to get on and off of trains and buses with ease. Um, it, it was just, uh, well, it, uh, it was something that I would like to, I'd like to experience for the rest of my life. That's amazing to hear and actually while we're talking about technology and uh, using a wheelchair and being able to get around the place it's a good time to sort of reflect on how do you think the technology's changed thinking about kind of the experience of athletes in 1964 and then now in Tokyo 2020 slash 21 it must be a really different experience in terms of the, the tech that people are using whether it's to compete or to help training what do you think? I think well I think technology has given um a huge degree of independence to people with a disability 
Uh, and, it, and I don't know whether that, it isn't always, of course, generated by sport, but there have been huge innovations in wheelchair design. Yeah. Um, and the, the technology that they use for racing wheelchairs, for instance, or wheelchair basketball, um, has been extended and disseminated down. Uh, so that I, I, I hope that wheelchair users generally benefit from it because you've got lighter wheelchairs and, and wheelchairs that are more tailored to individual needs. And the same goes with things like prosthetics. I mean, who'd ever heard of a blade um, back in the day? And, and the sort of blades that are used for racing and for uh, field events, for instance, are used in everyday life now, but not in the same form. So it's been it's been been beneficial from top to bottom. I think they used to call I've heard sport called uh, a war war a war without weapons, which perhaps is a little harsh, but it's 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 true in a way because um, technology advances. I think yes. at speed during something like a war because. The impetus seems to be greater, so you get faster change. And I think that's something that, that um, Paralympic sport in the main has, has been able to generate because it's been needed at that level, but it has actually filtered down and, and benefited, I hope, everybody. Yeah, Cass, that's such an important point because a war without weapons reminds me of the way that a lot of innovation and technology is driven. So with a mission, with a really clear mission that people need to drive for change, whether that's winning a war or putting a person on the moon. And oftentimes that's when we see the acceleration of a lot of technological innovation. So I, I love that, a war without weapons. It's a nice way of thinking about it. And of course, now we've got Johnny's Blade Camp on the telly. So it's quite a different scenario to the one that you began in, no? It is indeed. The, the, um, back in the day, I, re I remember that when I came to large competitions with other disabled people, it was the only time I felt normal. Ah. And, and that's, well, certainly for me, is no longer the case. Um, I, I can go pretty much anywhere and feel equal and have confidence that I'm as good as anybody else, which is not the way I started out. That's wonderful. That's wonderful because of the change in societal attitudes. Yeah, I think there's been a, a, a huge shift in perception. I wouldn't say that we're there yet. No. And some countries are further ahead than others. Yeah. Uh, but it's one of the it's one of the gifts I think that the Paralympics can help to give you because it has the focus and the publicity to drive that message. That's such a strong point. And actually, with the IPC and Loughborough University, GDI Hub screening the Paralympics for the first time in 49 countries in sub-Saharan Africa on free to air television this year. And we did that because we think, like, imagine if you'd never seen the Paralympics, what would your perception be and how would it be different? We think it makes a difference. But I wonder, you know, what do you think in terms of how the Games can impact the perception of, of disabilities? I think, I think they... Do and I think you. I mean, you mentioned London earlier. Yeah. I think London was um, a side shift in the way that disability sport was perceived. Yeah. Uh, and I can, I can remember. I can't even talk about it without, <laughs> without I getting it the same way. I know how you feel. Um, I remember sitting in the in the stadium and uh, and. The, the audience just concentrating on the performance rather than the disability. And it's exactly what you would want. It's exactly what you'd want as an athlete and as a disabled person. And we so need I, the tech to work to, to make that possible, right? <laughs> yes, we do. I mean, we do indeed. I mean, and, and I hope that every innovation, whether it be uh, improving sporting equipment for people, like, like you know, cycling or archery or shooting, can benefit people doing grassroots sport. Once you once you get the costs of the development out of the way, um, and it becomes more affordable, then hopefully it will benefit everybody. I love that. I love that idea. 
What a wonderful way to leave our chat. I would love to talk to you all day, Kaz. I'm so grateful to you for spending the time. Just before I move on, what are you most looking forward to seeing? Who's, who's performance? Give us your top tips. Top tips? Well, um, I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to, to pick any individuals out, but um, I, I hope that the Paralympics GB, being slightly biased on the British side, <laughs> um, will do as well as, if not better, than the Olympic team did because they showed us the way. Uh, we have a tremendous team and a huge team spirit and uh, just looking forward to showing the rest of the world what we can do. Or a bit better, right? Thanks for the warm-up, Team Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Kaz, thank you. And um, I'll be coming to my Japanese colleagues to hear who the top tips are on the Japanese team as well later on. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to listen to your um, reflections um, on an amazing journey and also slightly choked myself, which means it's time to hand over to um, uh, my colleague, Kathy Holloway. So I'm so grateful to Kathy, should say Professor Catherine Holloway, from the University um, College London um, UCL Interaction Centre, which means she knows a few things about techie stuff, uh, much more than me anyway. Um, over to you, Catherine, to tell us about where we're at in the world of tech research. Thanks, Vicky. Can everyone hear me OK? Can the next slide, Julia, please? don't need a slide about who I am. So um, one of the one of the ways in which GDI Hub looks at any sort of technology innovation is through this, what we're calling a disability in interactions framework or the disability interactions wheel. And on the outer edge of this, you have a look at what we call the, the kind of principles of disability innovation. And that is to understand that disability inclusion is, is a wicked problem. So you heard from Vicky and, and Kaz there, the power of the Power Olympics and social movements to try and tackle such a wicked problem. But globally, we know that people with disabilities are more likely to be in poverty and people who are poor are more likely to be disabled. And, and so people who are uh, who are uh, disabled and poor, they end up not being able to get access to technologies, not being able to watch the Paralympics, not being able to be included in society. So it is a wicked problem. It's very difficult to fix and it has multiple variables at play at any one time. So even if you fix one bit of the little jigsaw, it, it, the, rest of the, the rest of the jigsaw might move. Um, we like, you know, because of that, we co-create the solutions. So we co-create solutions with governments. So you heard Vicky say that we've helped to um, get the Paralympics screened in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So we work with you know, TV agencies, if that's who we need, or broadcasters, if that's who we need to work with. But I'm going to be talking today about the lower level of co-creation, the level of schools and, and making sure that people are able to uh, learn things. We look for radically different interactions. So by that we mean, how do we interact with technology? Can we change it completely? So sometimes that means changing the material science. Sometimes it means changing the, the way in which we uh, work um, with people. Sometimes it means bringing different actors into the room. And then, then the last two, value and usefulness and open and scalable. Um, value and usefulness is because, as Kaz just said, she would hope that when the Paralympics happens um, and you manage to get these innovations at the top level of sport, they trickle down. And so we see that, for example, in Formula One cars, you know, everybody's cars gets more efficient as Formula One cars get more efficient. However, we don't often see that translation within um, the assistive technology world. We do in some high income countries, but especially in low and middle income countries, we're unable to do that. And that is partly because we are not very good at valuing, like telling people or explaining the value to governments, to purchasers, to people who actually invest in technology, what the value of assistive technology is. And actually one insight we've had from our AT Impact Fund is when we've spoken to venture capitalists, there, there's a fundamental belief that people with disabilities will be unable to purchase a device and therefore they don't want to invest in a device. And so we want to change that perception completely. Um, and one way of changing that perception completely is, is around open and scalable technologies. So, you know, some of the great innovations we're going to see from KO University, some of the work we're doing internally at UCL, at our partners, Loughborough University, others, is we're trying to make as much of it open, not necessarily open source, but open to collaboration and scalable across the world. And so we do that through five different um, approaches uh, of the framework, which is participation, well-being, <clears throat> power, innovation and systems. 
So by that we mean that we make sure that the ultimate aim of anything we do is increases the participation of people with disabilities in all aspects of society, that it measures full well-being, so not just physical functionality like the biomechanics, but actually taking into consideration the psychological well-being, the idea of just having fun or being bored, whatever it is that people might want to do, that their full well-being is taken care of that power begins to rest with the persons with disability rather than outside of, of their control. Uh, we use innovation uh, to drive this and we take a systems approach because we know that if we innovate in a vacuum, we won't be able to solve anything. Next slide, Julia, please. So when I was putting these slides together, I realised we have 86 technology projects on the go at the moment and I had six minutes. So I'm just picking a couple. Uh, the first is Tassilia, which is a PhD student, one of my PhD students, Tiggy, um, his baby, if you like. And it came from, the reason I picked it is it's a brilliant example of basic and applied research together. So um, in terms, so basically he has managed to fundamentally use a new material science property that will enable a tactile display to read images and allow people with visual impairments to draw and create things as well as read tactile dry drawings more easily. So one of the problems we had faced in schools across India when we, we did this collaboratively with the Institute the IIT Delhi in India um, was that many children who were blind or visually impaired were unable to access uh, science and technology and engineering education because they couldn't read tactile images, couldn't read tactile graphs and couldn't create. Furthermore, they couldn't um, they weren't able to be artistic and artistic, as we know, is a, a wonderful thing to be. So we've used new material science properties. We've developed brand new interaction modes and the product is on its way to uh, going to market. So well done, Tiggy. You can follow more at hellotocilia.com. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is just a quick, so uh, yeah, you can just quickly see the video there. If Julia is able to play it for me. Uh, this is one of the first prototypes. Uh, Tiki's currently in India testing it, so I don't have a, uh, an updated one, but this is people drawing with the device. So if we go to the next, um, the next slide, please, Julia. The second, oops, Lots of them. Second example is smart wheelchairs. So sometimes people think of robots uh, like um, the robot you see there that looks maybe more stereotypically like a robot. Um, but we're, we're thinking of as how to make a smart wheelchair. Now, this wheelchair doesn't look particularly comfortable. and I'm sure Kaz wouldn't like to drive it in any way, shape or form around an, uh, an Olympic village or even just from the train station. But it contains a lot of sensors and that allows us to measure lots of things. And what we've been trying to do, you see on the right hand side, is understand how people in crowds navigate um, with robots. And so a wheelchair can become a robot when it's when it's fully automated. And you don't often want to fully automate something because obviously the person driving a wheelchair wants to be in control for most of the time. But some people struggle with um, fine motor control. So, for example, they might drive the wheelchair up to a door frame and then bash into the door frame lots of times because they don't have the control to get themselves through the door. But it's quite obvious they want to go through the door. So from our point of view, we should share the control. So we should be able to share the control so that the wheelchair takes over the tasks that the user finds difficult and hands back control to the user when um, when the, the task is within the user's ability range. One of the problems with this type of um, interaction type is what happens when you get into a crowd because the wheelchair then becomes a robot and a robot should do no harm and so a robot should not bump into anybody um, and therefore the wheelchair can have this stuck moment where the wheelchair takes over and sticks and you can't move it. Um, so we've been developing new heuristics, new rules to understand how people interact with robots, if they're a pepper robot or if it's a wheelchair robot. Um, and seeing how we could then allow and, and help wheelchair users navigate in, in larger crowds. Um, third uh, example, please, Julia, is um, just what we're doing on the impact fund. So none of these innovations came from GDI Hub, Koala, Miracle Feet, Wazi, which is an eyeglasses company, Herex, which screens for whether or not you need a hearing aid, and OADCPH, which is a, a, an innovation in logistics. But what GDI Hub is doing is helping to build the evidence for innovation. So a lot of the times these great innovations get stuck, especially in low income uh, settings where you either have a charity model or you have no model of, of scaling distribution. And therefore, 90 percent of people across the world, so that's 900 million people, don't get access to the assistive technology they need. So what we're doing is working with each of these companies 
to build evidence of both the ecosystem, so trying to explain how big the market size is, for example, for upper limb prosthetics in Sierra Leone, but also do the user testing with users to understand what the value is for the user so that we can build both stories and business cases and, and further grow um, the sector. So uh, last slide, I think, Julia, and I'll hand back, yes, to Massa. Over to you, Massa, and your dreaming. Thank you very much, Cathy. That was a wonderful canter through some of the work you're doing. And without further ado, Massa Inakadje, I think is how you say, is the Dean and Professor of Akio Media School. We've been working with you for a year or so now, and we are delighted that our partnership is progressing. Over to you, Massa, to introduce Thanks, yourself. Vicky. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, we're very honoured to be part of this exciting journey uh, together with UCL GDA Hub. Um, we believe um, the inclusive, inclusive society is the wave of the future of society. Um, at KO Media Design, um, the former name is KO University Graduate School of Media Design. No one can remember, so we shorten it to KO Media Design and we further shorten it to KMD. So sometimes you hear KO Media Design, sometimes you hear KMD. Um, next slide, please, Julia. So we're uh, focusing everything on how to use the power of creativity and to innovate, especially during this time of um, the COVID. We believe the Great Reset will allow us to redesign, reshape the society in much, much sustainable way and much more desirable and, and inclusive uh, society than what we have today. And in doing so, uh, we are very interested in using our imagination. Next slide, please. Um, which leads to our belief that the dream future of society looks like a creative society, and that's also very inclusive. The part of everyone's creativity, whether you are not good at drawing or unable to sing or you um, use instruments, uh, even if you can imagine something, you are very creative. And there are lots of examples in our everyday life around the world that shows the power, human capability of creativity is how we form the society to enrich our everyday life. Next slide, please. So at KMD, um, we have a process to come up with an idea, which we call Blue Sky, and we try out and fail, and we go through this iteration of prototyping, and hopefully some of our ideas will deliver it to the society and the world. Um, and we call this social impact, and it's very important for us to not stop at academic excellence and contribution, but move beyond academic uh, realm to the real society. The more we can do, the better our society will be. Next slide. So we recently came up with a new method or approach called dream driven design um, is to design our future with the power of our dreaming or daydreaming and imagination. This is the human capability that we have, which the current computing technology may not be well equipped with. Next slide, please. So as you can see with some of the visual materials, we enjoy people being very creative and enjoy the environment that we are with the creative acts. How can we use all of these imagination to design something that we wish to have? It's not something that you can actually build with your hand, but at least you can imagine and wish something that you want to have. Next slide, please. And to attract people's attention about your dream ideas, we want to be very playful and artful so that people will show interest in your idea. Next slide, please. And we use the question called what if to challenge ourselves of the status quo and to move out of our comfort zone and do out of box thinking. What if we can talk to plants? What would you do? What would you like to talk? How would you invite plants to be part of our society. These are some bold ideas and questions that 
your idea can move from just a bit of interesting idea to some, something that might be very important in the, our next future society. Next slide, please. So there are lots of things um, to design about future. So we call this future of X. It can be a future of city or future of work that everyone, every company is really striving to redesign the corporate structure, what the office would look like in the future if you have lots of um, work from home in the future as well. Uh, how would the future of school work? Do we still use the traditional classroom experience or is it going to be vastly different, etc.? cetera? Um, next slide, please. So because of the, um, due to the time constraint today, um, I'm just going to bundle into a few future of X. The first one obviously is future of planet. Everyone is keen on sustainability and healthier planet of where we live in. Uh, so we do have lots of projects around this topic. Next slide, please. Uh, future of society and lifestyle. As we are experiencing this COVID uh, pandemic, everyone is rethinking what is the individual value or societal value? How do we reshape our lifestyle of everyday life? Maybe it was very um, stressful um, after the Industrial Revolution. We need to work late, long hours, very stressful moments. But maybe the, the way we work, the way we live can be very different. Next slide, please. Next slide, Julia. Julia. Do we have a technical problem of slides? I think we're just reloading. OK. So while we're waiting, um, so the OK, excellent. So future of culture and arts definitely is part of us. Uh, we want to be uh, very expressive and invite invent new tools, new instruments, new things that would allow us to be more expressive rather than just coming up and imagining uh, wild ideas. Next slide, please. Maybe my slide is very heavy then. Let's wait for a while. Um, as you can see, um, Kota Minamizawa is going to um, explain a bit about our project around musical instrument for, um, for disabilities as you can see in the slide. Apologies, can you not see where I'm technically on future of communication? Yeah, um, I can see. My, oh, are you? My slide, my screen says future of culture and arts. No, I see future of communication. OK, so. Yeah, we I... also see future of communication. I think maybe Mansad side. Oh, OK. All right, right. OK, so so future communication, definitely we are social being and we want to communicate and socialize. But again, with the lockdown and many things are changing the way we communicate and socialize. So we're interested in redefining what would be uh, a more sustainable communication of the future. Next slide, please. I assume you will see the startup and commercialization. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. OK, so um, all of these efforts uh, as we've been exploring this pipeline from ideation to iterations of prototyping and hitting the society. Uh, one way is to commercialize um, and come up with viable businesses. So we are very um, interested in startup culture and also um, acceleration track for making our ideas come to viable business. And my final slide is the, the first slide that you saw. And with this, I would like to pass over to my one of my faculties, Kota Minamizawa, uh, to explain about his exciting projects. So thank you very much. Thank you, Masa.
Yeah, thank you very much. So I'd like to start uh, introducing our projects. I'm Kota Minamizu, our, our professor at KMD. So yeah, as you see in this slide, so you, we are mainly working on the creating the new type of uh, experiences that using the technology to expand our bodies. Oh, yep. So then, so yeah, I, as you see, there's several projects that so you can feel something from the digital world, or uh, you can feel, or we, uh, we can feel the kind of virtual sensation on your body, or also we are also creating the human robot avatar that can enable you to walk or behave from the remote space. And also the kind of the human augmentation, like creating a tail, create, uh, add, 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 adding a tail to your body or adding sad arm to your body. That kind of things are uh, going on. Please next, go to the next slide. Next slide, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the project about enhancing our senses. So the, we are creating a jacket that the people can feel the surrounding environment on their bodies. So in this video, the uh, guy with the uh, visually impaired, visually impaired people, yeah, he is actually visually impaired and he is now wearing a jacket and he can feel the environment around him. So the technology behind that is that so that you, the jacket have uh, more than 20 actuators on it and uh, this is also uh, connected to the smartphone and based on the sounding kind of sensor data and also your GPS data the uh, jacket can provide you uh, kind of a guidance sensation on your body and please go to the next slide so also using the uh, avatar technologies in this case we in uh, there is the left side uh, he, she is uh, in the kind of the hospital. I see actually in the nursing home, and she couldn't uh, participate the wedding ceremony of her grandson. But we created an avatar robot can, that can uh, invite her to the wedding ceremony. So in the wedding, wedding ceremony, on the right picture, so you can find the avatar robot, which is using the paper. So then the grandmother can dive into the avatar using Hetman display. Then the grandmother can see the, uh, the, the sounding environment from the uh, robot eyes. So then also she could meet the, uh, the light side of the lady who is a bride. So then she could first time to meet her using this kind of the, uh, remote experiences. Also, please go to the next slide. The next one is uh, showing the another project called the Muge Arm, which is designing a processes hand, which is not working as a hand and arm, but working as a music instrument. So the story behind that is that there was a, a man who who, uh, who who lost his right arm. Uh, from he born and but he is usually uh, using the processing hand in their, his daily life, but he actually loves music and he would like to play music by himself. But current technology of the processing hand doesn't allow that, so it's too difficult for him to play music instrument. Then yeah, our, we our team and he directly uh, discussed that what if we can design new hand to play the music. Then uh, we created the music hand, uh, instrument that can be attached to his uh, arm. So then as you see, there's a keyboard, drum, guitar, various type of the uh, processing uh, arms that can actually work as a music instrument. The next one is the so basically we are doing this, developing this kind of technologies and uh, designing for uh, designing new technology for the diverse people, but we also are organizing a sports society, which is called Superhuman Sports Society, which is trying to design new sports 
uh, with uh, applying this kind of the human augmentation technologies. So our aim is to make it possible for the people, many people, to play sports with the help of the technologies. It's kind of something beyond Paralympics. So now the Olympics and the Paralympics have a kind of a different organization, but we believe that so that in the future, the human will use, a, use the technology in the daily life and the, any people can enhance their abilities. So then in that kind of a future society, there's no actually no uh, barrier between the Olympics and the Paralympics and everybody will play sports together with enhancing their abilities with technologies. The next slide shows uh, several kind of the, uh, cases that we designed that we are design. We, we have already designed um, almost 30 sports uh, in these five years. Then this is kind of an example that so that using VR, using the uh, wheelchairs or using augmented reality or using more like a physical mechanical augmentation of our body. Then the next one is the last slide I am introducing. So this is the recent kind of work we are doing that uh, it's the future wheelchair, which can not only for uh, moving forward, but which more like uh, uh, expressing yourself more freely. So this wheelchair can kind of move very freely and also that it is also possible to drift so and also the rotate on drift so yeah as you see uh the people who use usually use the wheelchair or people who first time to use a wheelchair can play together with the uh this kind of a drift experience of the uh this slide drift and also the performers uh, also using this wheelchair to enhance their uh, performance like that. So yeah, this kind of the new type of the human uh, body expression. Also this kind of the, com it's combining the wheelchair and avatar robot technologies. Also we can make it possible for the, uh, make it possible to help the wheelchair users from remote places. So in this case, so the, the additional arm um, is controlled by the remote supporters and they, they can support a wheelchair user from remote place. Yeah, like that, so that we are working on the various type of the design and the technology project that combining human uh, human organization technology for the uh, disabled people to make it possible to lift the barrier between kind of the uh, the between uh, diverse people so yeah i hope that this kind of a technology can uh, help to create the future society in which everyone can uh, pray together and uh, share their experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kota Minimasa. Wow, <laughs> sorry, my pronunciation is terrible, but your projects are amazing. And just seeing all of those different ways that you're using accessible technology is phenomenal. Thank you for sharing those with us, so cool. Over to Kai Kunse, who's gonna continue the story from Kyo. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, it's always uh, difficult to follow up after Kota. Uh, with his work, but I'll I'll try. Uh, so um, this is now um, kind of a different tone. So I'm mostly mostly interested in in sensing. So if you go also to the next slide. So actually, my my background is is mostly in variable computing. So kind of completely uh, tech nerd, and I try to help people mostly in in maintenance scenarios or um, you know Paris firefighters hospitals or so on to uh, augment their work with digital technologies and since 
maybe around five or six years, I got more and more interested also what is going on in your mind, you know, kind of trying to use eye trackers, trying to use uh, enhancements like Google Glass or also some type of brain sensing, maybe not as bad as the picture below, but, you know, kind of something more, more wearable to understand more about the user, understand more about our everyday situations. Uh, next slide, please. So, so really my background is uh, this idea of can we use digital technologies to understand a little bit more what is going on in our mind in everyday life. And we started out with, uh, you know, these eye trackers you see on the slide or also Google Glass. However, it's still awkward to wear them and it's still, you know, kind of not... And it depends on the society you're in, but maybe, you know, kind of in Japan, some things might be more acceptable versus uh, I'm originally from Germany. And if you, you know, use Google Glass or so on, people will look uh, strangely at you or so on uh, to things that are more integrated. Uh, can you press? I think there should be some uh, image popping up. Yeah, yeah, right. And happily, uh, I was working. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I was working with Jins. It's a Japanese glasses maker on uh, on these glasses. These are just sensing glasses for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. And mostly with them on on sensing and interaction scenarios. So you know, kind of, uh, we had uh, systems that detect your fatigue, your alertness. We had systems where you can uh, interact just with head nod or with eye movement or also nose movement uh, with the systems. That's kind of my background. But then uh, uh, next slide. Since a, a couple of uh, uh, days now, we moved over uh, since around a year or so on, we moved over to emotional feedback. And in this case, really trying to figure out uh, more what physiological signals can really tell us about our emotional experience. And we started looking into uh, these systems in performances. So in this case, you know, kind of all of the audience members would stream their heart rate and galvanic skin response data. So data that uh, corresponds to your stress levels, to your excitement and so on. And we would then live change uh, projection, light or sound of a performance. So you're creating a feedback loop with the audience and you understand better, you know, kind of this uh, invisible link between uh, audience members and also the uh, performers and trying to enhance that. Uh, next slide. So this is a small video uh, from one of the performances. Uh, so this is also a collaboration with, with Kota. And and what you can see is just uh, that we had now the infrastructure to um, get real life data from um, sixty to seventy audience members, and then change on stage the sound, the visuals, as well as projections, which in then in turn also changes the dancers' performance, uh, and then. Uh, it changes back to the to the audience again. So really creating this type of feedback loop and thinking about more, I would say, creative ways to use sensor data. Uh, you can go to the next slide. I think that's okay. And and we wanted to actually take this work uh, further uh, with the collaboration. This is uh, Kelly Hunter uh, Flute Theatre, uh, Flute Theatre in London, and also uh, Jamie uh, Ward, a uh, friend uh, from Goldsmith, uh, to analyze and understand uh, systems in inclusive theatre. Uh, however, due to COVID, this didn't really happen. But we're still looking forward to to keeping that alive. And here, the idea is they are already doing these um, or exploring interpersonal synchrony in. Uh, inclusive theater, especially related to uh, a, a neuro, uh, neurodegenerative disease and also um, then also spectrum uh, uh, disorders. And uh, here it's really this idea of exploring more about the um, differences in how we synchronize, how we entrain our uh, physiology. Uh, next slide. Uh, however, uh, to um, 
to explore that further, also what we're doing right now is we're exploring frisson. That's the feeling you get usually when you're listening to music performances and it moves you a lot. Uh, so this type of aesthetic chills. And in that case, we're really trying not only to um, understand that uh, feeling in terms of sensing, but also really actuate it over uh, pelty elements, over cold showers that go over your neck. Uh, next slide. Uh, so overall, uh, you saw a little bit now my background and also the direction that we want to go with the work that is really on this level of trying to un understand ourselves better over these physiological uh, sensors. And we want to evaluate the spontaneous reactions. And I really want to push this forward to use physiological sensing as a way to uh, maybe build an uh, accessibility assessment toolkit to understand yourself better in stressful situations. And I just also plead for a more creative way to use this uh, physiological sensing, not only, you know, kind of for advertisement or just uh, also medical appliances. So that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. Well, I have to say, if you'd have measured my frisson during that performance, you would have found some real live data that was very impressive indeed. And I hope that you're in touch with um, Associate Professor Yongjun Chow in our team, because I think you'd have a lot to talk about. Um, Okay, I am handing over to our final presenter now. So I, mean, I don't know how she's going to top this, but I know that she will because Julia has been with us since the start. Julia Barbareski, thank you for making all of the work happen to, to make this amazing session happen. Now over to you, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Vicky. So um, how do you top that? Well, that is indeed extremely difficult, uh, but I should try to do my best. Uh, so, uh, good morning everyone, afternoon, evening, middle of the night, really depending on where you are in the world and, and what time um, would you be watching this recording. My name is uh, Dr. Julia Barbareski and I'm a research fellow at the Global Disability Innovation Hub. And I'm also an upcoming JSPS fellow at the KO School of uh, Media Design. Uh, what I would like to introduce to you today, it's a project we're all really excited about. It's our first big collaboration between the Global Disability Innovation Hub and, and KMD, and it's called um, AT, Artistic Technologies, and it aims to sort of reimagine disability through a set of different lens. Um, I would also give, like to give a shout out to a very good friend of mine, Jason Wilshire Mill, whose amazing art you're uh, seeing on, uh, um, on the screen of the slides is called Brave Boy Billy. And uh, it's, um, it's a disabled gentleman that uh, instead of moving around on a wheelchair, sits on his uh, space hopper. And Jason has been a huge um, inspiration for um, for this project. When we think about um, technology around disability, um, one of the main sort of uh, paradigm of design that it's used nowadays, it's the one of problem solving. Um, functionality, increasing functionality is usually the primary driver. Um, so we start from this idea of, of there being a functional gap that needs to be bridged through technology. Um, another thing that it's quite important, it's a very common goal of these technologies is to be unobtrusive um, to be noticed as little as possible. Um, but both these ideas promote like a, an image of disabilities as some, something uh, that causes people to miss something, to have a functional gap, and uh, that the technologies that are used should not be noticed. It's almost like we're trying it to hide it under the carpet. And, and this sort of fuels um, stigma quite a lot. When we look through the artistic expressions of, of disabilities, um, we find something that it's completely different. Um, art and, and disabilities does really help 
um, to change the narrative. Um, it promotes an image of disability that it's a different experience, but it's not necessarily a worse one. Um, and the focus moves away from a uh, function to one of, of self self expressions, but also sharing um, sort of one stories and telling one stories and in our own term. And you've seen in, in many of the cases that have been shown by like our wonderful um, colleagues, it's that assistive technologies then become something cool, something loud and, and visible, um, not something quiet that sort of needs to hide um, in the background. Um, and other things that I would like to draw your attention on, it's some of the amazing technologies that have emerged um, in the last few years to help um, everyone really engage with art. And I literally mean everyone because um, I am absolutely terrible in any sort of um, artistic expression, being visual arts, um, um, uh, music, never mind sculpture, like let's not even go there. Uh, but uh, there is so many new tools that help everyone engage from extended reality, so virtual reality or augmented reality for painting, to AI that sort of supports drawing, or the use of motion captures to record gestures that can be used for anything from composing music, um, to create new shapes and, and sort of digital sculptures, but also um, new manufacturing techniques like 3D printing and other kinds of rapid digital manufacturing that, that really helps us um, create this um, new, uh, new artistic expression in, in something tangible. Um, the, the Brave Boy Billy um, sculpture that, that I showed at the very beginning uh, of um, uh, of my bit of the presentation, it was made using a 3D printer that embedded tags made by um, children in, that uh, told their stories of their experience of of disabilities. And there is something extremely powerful um, in this. So what we want to do as part of this project is to create, rather than technology for disability, disability-inspired technologies that really promote self-expression and, and do help reshape the narrative around disability. Um, how are we planning to do this? Uh, well, the first step will be to create personalized tools because everyone is different. So we want to engage with um, people with disabilities, artists, designers, engineers, and really create modular tools that can fit people's preferences um, in terms of use, in terms of assistive technologies, um, in terms of um, capabilities, but also the type of art, uh, if you will, that they would like to engage with. Um, and, and we also want to promote artistic expression that leverage the existing competencies um, that people with disabilities have. And I can't stress this enough. Um, there is so much skills that go into being able to use um, assistive technologies in the way many people with disabilities do. Um, and there is an awful lot of, of capabilities that, that we can build on. And another important point is that um, these technologies, sometimes we might want to be them to be unobtrusive and sometimes we want them to be visible and loud, but it's really about handing over control about when and how people want um, to be visible. The second part of the project, it's really um, going to revolve around the um, creation of uh, digital galleries that uh, enable people to share and create collective experiences. So that, yes, people can create art, but art is something that should be shared um, with others in ways that are accessible. So we can showcase uh, what we do, we can inspire others, but especially really challenge um, people and, and people's image of what disabilities is. And ultimately what we want to do is enable people with disabilities to create 
and, and share a more complex and truthful um, narratives of disability that moves away from traditional stereotypes. Um, as we hope the gallery will become something global, we also want to see how culture shapes different um, experiences and, and imaging of, of disability, but ultimately really create a long lasting legacy that will go beyond um, the end of this project. Um, so if you're in any way interested around, about this, uh, do you get in touch? We're planning to be uh, starting the project in October. Um, we're literally um, keen in engaging with everyone, um, assistive technology users, artists, designers, engineers, anyone really that is interested. Um, the project is mainly going to be uh, based in Japan, but we're also keen on establishing links with the rest of the world. And you can really get in touch about anything. If you like to collaborate, if you want to share ideas, if you would like to sign up as a prospective participant, if you want to tell us that you hate the project, if you want to ask for information, literally um, anything is game. So uh, thank you so much for your attention and we hope to hear from you soon. Julia, thank you for our uh, roundup um, of that presentation. I have three questions for us just before we round off today. And they've come in from our uh, social media. So we've been uh, tweeting out about the panelists and the discussion today. And firstly, I'm coming right back to Julia. So I'm going to kick off with a question from uh, Twitter and the person was asking, uh, thinking about developing new skills and creating employment opportunities for persons with disabilities or disabled people, are you thinking about that in your project? Um, we are. We're not thinking directly on employability in the sense of creating transferable skills necessarily, although that would be a wonderful spillover if possible. Uh, but what we really want to do is enable people to showcase the skills that they already have and, and put them into practice in something that it's meaningful um, for them. So it's not so much about developing new skills, although, you know, practice may be perfect. They always tell me that if I start drawing, I might become good at it. So you never know. Uh, but it's really more about showcasing the skills that people already have and enable them to leverage them more. But brilliant uh, if we can attract more persons with disabilities to participate in arts and culture, um, as I'm sure our friends um, in arts organisations will tell us, including the British Council, who've actually been a really interesting um, partner for us over the years on these projects. Thanks, Julia. My second question um, is around how do we make sure all this brilliant work is happening? But how are persons with disabilities or disabled people involved in being researchers and innovators? Massa, I'm going to come to you first and then maybe Cathy. Sure, um, I'm sure um, Professor Minamizawa's work and Kai Kunze's work already involve um, and invite um, people with disabilities as part of the co-researchers and co-work, co-creators of um, and to invent. Um, it, it is absolutely important and necessary for um, everyone to be involved in the co-creation process uh, because um, if you can't really see things through the lens of um, the target people, uh, you miss out some of the opportunities and important points. Um, so I'm definitely uh, interested in having artistic technology with um, Julia's work to have all the people that we want to involve and to target, be part of our team um, and to co-create the, the journey of uh, designing artistic technologies. Perfect. And Kyle Kota, would you think you'd like to jump in too? Yeah, actually, so we have been collaborating with the uh, visually impaired people and also deaf people and also the uh, users of prosthetic arms, also wheelchair users. And also the, we also recently collaborating with the senior people. And also one, yeah, also one more thing about the, also the related to employment. So our collaborator has been launched, established a new cafe. 
which the ALS patients or SMA patient which who cannot kind of move their bodies can use the avatars to uh, walk as a cafe, cafe uh, to, to deliver the coffee to the uh, participants of the shop. So yeah, we are also starting to explore how we can make it available for the people to uh, to work through these kind of technology. Thank you. And from the UK side, I guess, Cathy, jump in if you want to, but we, so firstly, many of us are, in fact, persons with disabilities in our team. Uh, over to you, Kath. Well, we are beginning, we, we do a lot of work to our master's students um, on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, working with local groups and, and local disabled people. Um, we're beginning to develop a, a kind of community of disability innovators, if you like, globally. And um, we're actually going to launch a, a network um, in, in September. So watch this space. But mainly, I think there's two things to remember. One is that uh, people with disabilities or disabled people are people. So some people want to be involved in design and some people don't. They just want the design to be done well and, and, and to come back to you. So I think there's something to remember that um, not everybody wants to be a co-designer, uh, but the people that do want to be co-designers, I think the more we can empower people with disabilities who want to be part of the design innovation process, to have the tools themselves to be leading the change, that's um, that would be the ultimate aim for me. Totally agree, and that's why we've campaigned hard to make sure we have equal access to our master's programme and such like. So last question, um, which was for me, uh, but anyone else can jump into, which is how, how has the narrative changed? And I think I'm going to reflect back on Kaz's statement, because for me, it was so poignant. So when Kaz said that when she first went to the Tokyo Paralympic Games, she felt normal for the first time. And now she feels normal everywhere she goes um, in her life. And so for me, that's that's really how things have changed in a nutshell. I think that that's not the case everywhere in the world. Um, and I think our job is to make sure, and not for everyone in every community in every country either. And so our job is to make sure we move on from whether disability inclusion is a vital part of our work and lives to how we do it really well. And so the, the move from kind of inclusion to disability innovation and disability justice, which respects the diversity of persons with disabilities and, and the movement was obviously born out of the CRPD and the, sorry, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and continues to be a real movement for, um, for change and something that we need to address everywhere around the world. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one? How has the narrative changed? I'd be interested from our Japanese colleagues, um, maybe Masa and, and Ko, like, ha have you seen a change in narrative in, in Tokyo in the last few years? Well, so um, as uh, someone's uh, mentioned about assistive technology to start from the negative and trying to go to a sort of a minimum level so that you can, it's functional, to something more powerful idea of making it very cool um and maybe having this kind of assistive technology in everyday life for everyone of different kinds of us uh would make us more confident and enable and enjoyable for um, doing whatever you want to do and i think that's the future of um, assistive technology it's not just for the so-called disabilities for every but it's for everyone well, that's that's the way to leave it. Thank you so much to everyone for your participation today. I'm also going to give an enormous shout out to Team GDI in the background who've been beavering away trying to make this happen despite a uh, um, Zoom being down in the UK, and to all of the contributions from um, Team Keo, which have just been phenomenal. I can only see a bright and shiny future of us working together over the next ten years, um, and I, I'm excited to see what's going to happen. Um, Thanks to Julia for pulling this together. Thanks to BPA and thanks to Kaz. And then just a moment. So We The 15 is a 10 year campaign. Our partnership, I hope, will be a similar length, if not longer. And so in 10 years time, I wonder what we'll all look back on to say we've achieved. What will we have done to further disability innovation for a further world? And how do we set that in train today? Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a joy and a pleasure. And I look forward to many more discussions like this in the future. Thank you.